Welcome and aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Our next to last, our penultimate, to use one of my English major words, session of 2023, <clears throat> headed on for 2024, whatever the heck that may be. And we're going to talk about exactly that today with the wonderful Professor Emerita Bernelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law, now in Orlando, Florida. <clears throat> and having had the luxury and respite of having Florida be essentially Ron DeSantis free for months at a time. Thank you, so Iowa. Wonderful. Thank you, Iowa and New Hampshire and whoever else will take this guy for however long they can take him, because I can't. And David Larson, a wonderful immediate past chair of, well, recent past chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, which is about to become substantially more inclement than we are here in Hawaii or Professor Randall is in Orlando. So David, you have our, <clears throat> our prospective sympathies, but hopefully it's still fairly decent there now. Yeah, we're in the mid fifties today, um, which doesn't happen in Minnesota in December. So hey. we have very warm weather. And mid fifty in December is twice what it could be. So yeah, yeah easily. <laughs> so how are things where you are, Professor Randall? It's really nice. The winter is, the weather's nice and winter's nice and it's very now. I mean, you know, we still, we're losing uh, people moving out of the state, which is professional people, uh, people, especially university level and college level people. I know personally at least a half a dozen people, Black people, who have uh, moved out of state because of the politics of Florida. And it's, it's, it's Ron DeSantis, but it's more. I mean, he doesn't do anything in a vacuum. Uh, he's got a, uh, a, a legislature, legislature, get the word right, I'm being Trump now. Uh, <laughs> he's got a house and a President Senate. President who don't speak English, George Bush and Donald Trump. <laughs> who are willing to pass the most radical laws uh and and uh and then implement them and uh and so that I mean that that hasn't changed um we have a state that has one of the highest un health and uninsurance rates so the state is in a poor state uh, uh for people who are struggling um, so, uh, but the weather's nice. What can I say? <laughs> no, and that's really good. And I, I mean, I have to admit, I have an advantage that nobody in any other U.S. state has being here in Hawaii. I am, I grew up in and am a refugee from <laughs> Wisconsin, which has since gone to very dark places in its legislature. Um, trying to fight for its political survival, and it's a struggle. It's up in the air, so to speak. Uh, but and people ask me, so, so, so Chuck, how come Hawaii is such a blue state? We have a handful, not even a dozen, Republican state legislators, right? We haven't had a Republican governor for a while. We haven't had a Republican mayor for a while. We haven't had we haven't had Republicans for a while. I can't tell you. What a side really and so people ask, how come how come that is? I said, look, we are 80% Asian Pacific. <clears throat> we are a culture that is spiritually, morally, ethically wiser, more grounded, more balanced, more big picture long term <clears throat> than any other in the country. I'm not bragging. I'm just recognizing a fact, right? Asian Pacific Americans are far stronger 
in that area than the rest of the country. And Alaska Airlines has just bought Hawaiian Airlines, and that's fine, as long as they let the indigenous Alaskans run it. Right? With the, can you imagine the indigenous Alaskans and the indigenous Hawaiians together running an airline? Get out of the way, United, American, Delta, all those guys. What a, and better yet, what if those airlines, the merged airline, were run by indigenous Hawaiian and Alaskan women? Well, all I, I mean, you, you know, I, I certainly don't know the Asian American culture like you do, so I can't really talk about that. But I do know that they're pretty conservative on the mainland uh, as a group. Uh, I and I ha I work with I uh, I'm in coalitions with many. I guess I I'm reluctant to identify a specific racial group as being better than all the rest of us in sort of uh, spiritual things and stuff like that. I think I think that that there are groups and there are locations and there are people who definitely ha have their stuff together. But I also think that, that those features cross many cultures. And, pick it up on. and, and that's pick, certainly pick true. It. And I apologize, David, but I, I really need to respond quickly to that. I, I think that's true, but it's true because in large part here, the Asian Pacific's are in their own culture. There, they're in an adverse culture dominated by people at their expense. Of course, they're going to be conservative to protect themselves. That's what conservatism at its best is. It protects rights, values, and relationships. It's not what it is now politically for the Republicans, but that's what conservatism at its best really is. That's what Lincoln Republicanism was and could be. But they are not that kind of argument we all should be conservative yes if we're in environments dominated by zero-sum people at our expense and all and on the mainland every group is in that kind of situation that's absolutely right but every group has not adopted a conservative viewpoint related to politics in the united states I guess I don't want, I don't, I really don't want to go down the road. I'm just challenging the idea that, I mean, that we can name that. I don't know about Asian Pacific Islanders in Hawaii. I have no clue. And so I can't speak to that. But I, but the statement you made seemed very general and to encompass all Asian. Pacific Islanders, and I just know that my experience, and and I'm not faulting them. I'm just saying that my experience is they tend to be more conservative, they uh, as a group, and uh, so yeah. But you raise a really really good point. I agree with you 100. percent Everything you said is true, but putting it back in context because they are a collective society and culture. It's not the people, it's not the race, it's the culture that is conservative in the sense that it's protective of the relationships and values that most deserve it. It's the culture, not, they could be green. And if that were their culture, that would be but their- But then story. race is nothing but culture. Race is a social construction based on the environment that people come from, been grown in. It's not a biological thing. It's not even a color thing. It's right. a culture thing. Black people are black not because they have brown skin, but because they have a history born out of slavery, segregation, and racism and have a culture that connects us uh, and I'm talking about descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States. I'm not talking about immigrant Blacks who come from different cultures. Uh, but 
uh, descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States have a culture that's born out of that. And people identify us as a race because that's the crazy thing that America does. But we are Use it culture, against you. And we can't, and we have a hard time getting people to want to say, yes, you are a culture. And, and, uh, in fact, one of the things that I try to get the, and I did, I have to admit, I didn't really push it real hard, but I did write a couple of letters. I think, for instance, that, um, the, um, uh, what am I trying to say? The Census Bureau should put Deus, descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States, or something similar as an ethnic group that can be identified for Black people. Are you Deus? Do you do you come from that culture? No, you're exactly but right. I, and, and I want to, and I apologize, but I, I want to for our listeners and anybody who views this, I want to remind people, you are now listening to truly the ultimate authority, not just in Orlando, not just in the U.S., but probably in the world, on racism, what it really is, where it comes from, and its impact. And what, Professor Randall, you just pointed out, the most core, brilliant insight of all is that for Blacks, as for Asians, hopefully, and Pacific Islanders, a race is a resource. It's a strength. It's a cultural resource. But for people opposed to that group, it is a weapon. And that distinction of who defines race as what, which definition and application predominate, continues to be central. I think the points you've just made highlight that in ways that, for me, I'm only 77. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody articulate that core conflict and tension that clearly. Thank you. David? Earlier, earlier I was going to echo something that Professor Randall said about location. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to work from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, the American West, mm -hmm. um, from Minnesota to Mississippi, uh, to Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., to Omaha, Nebraska. And there are distinctly different cultures um, as we move around the country. And we had a discussion before we came online. Professor Randall was saying that people are leaving, leaving Florida and educated people are living in Florida because of that location, because of what's happening in the culture around them. And they're finding it intolerable. Um, you know, so I'm in Minnesota where we're where we're kind of clean to our kind of our blue heritage, but we're right next door to Wisconsin. And Chuck was mentioning mm -hmm. that Wisconsin has gone some dark places. Now these are very demographically, they're not very different. And geographically, they have a long contiguous border. So um, and there's a lot of exchange going back between the two states. So why is it so why are we so different? And we are different in our politics, uh, taking some very different positions in terms of our legislation. And a lot has to do with the political process and how it's being organized. And, you know, in Wisconsin, there's been significant gerrymandering and they've arranged the electoral districts. So it's impossible for minority populations to get any representation in the legislature. When you have statewide elections, then it's sweepingly democratic, democratic. But in the local elections, they've got these bizarre lines that are making it impossible to get any representation in the legislature, which then means that the legislature can pass very conservative uh, legislation. So, yeah, I think a lot has to do with where you are and what political forces are controlling the access to the vote. Um, and we're seeing all of this unfolding uh, right in front of us. Um, now, one thing we had talked about before we went online was what's going to happen in this coming year. Um, you know, what are we going to look like in 2024? And uh, you know, sometimes it's scary to think about as we look at the presidential politics unfolding. Um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is how our lives are going to change with artificial intelligence. Because in the news, chat GPT, now we have chat GPT 4+, you know, we've got these iterations 
artificial intelligence moving very quickly. And some people are who are deeply invested in the technology field said, you got to slow down. This is getting way ahead of us and we're losing control of it. There's going to be all kinds of implications. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is exciting. And these generative AI models that can generate text and images um, are very powerful. Uh, I think they're great tools and we accomplish a lot of things with them. But if you look at chat GPT, for example, you now have a chat GPT 4 plus um, that's much more powerful than the chat GPT 3.0 and 3.5. 3.5 is available for free. But this supermodel, which has capabilities that chat GPT 3.5 doesn't have costs, that's not insignificant. So um, when we start thinking about the ability of artificial intelligence to enhance our lives and enhance our productivity, not everybody's going to have access to that best technology. I mean, that's already true today, but I think that is going to accelerate. Um, and that, to me, is very worrisome because the power of these new technologies exceeds a lot of what we've had before. And if only some people have access to it, to the degree we've got polarization and separation, that's only going to increase. So I think we really need to pay attention to what's happening in the in the AI field. See, and, and that point connects directly, as you said, to exactly what Professor Randall and we are talking about, which is if AI, and we're going to talk about this next week's session, it is going to be exactly on this. If AI becomes the weapon, as race and other concepts have, of that zero sum, 1%, whatever you want to call them, <clears throat> then it will do far more harm than good. If it becomes the resource of those most in need, most vulnerable, most underserved, and those who are their allies and their supporters and their protectors, AI could bring a world of good. That's going to be the fight. That's going to be the tension. That's going to be the conflict. And where that goes and who influences where that goes it's going to be of critical importance. Yeah, because it definitely... I guess, I just, Go ahead. I, I'm reluctant to hinge anything on AI making things better. I mean, if you get in a... Uh, you know, my viewpoint is racism, and that's where I come from. And any system born out of racism is going to promote racism. And, and we have not sufficiently dealt with the racism in existing systems. Uh, and in, in what we've done with AI, whatever generative or otherwise, is uh, used flawed programmers, people who have stereo bias and prejudice, and use flawed databases. And while those, while they're, the thing is, is how do children learn racism? They learn it from seeing their parents and media and other people, other things engage in it. AI will do the same thing. They, it will, it will promote, it will, uh, uh, underpin and I don't know I, I I would like to see I mean we haven't we don't we don't have systems to assure food equity educational equity health care equity uh housing equity uh and I just and climate change AI and is just going to be another water uh climate I mean, you name Air. a system, yeah, you name a system. I just say AI is just going to be another system within an existing flawed uh, culture system. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is you got to, I'm saying that, like it or not, it's happening, it's happening fast, it's exploding. And um, to the degree that I think many of us understand, that in many respects, AI is backward looking because it's drawing on history and drawing on databases. But we, but I, what I'm saying is that 
let's acknowledge the fact that this is just too seductive and it's it's going to go forward and it's going to be powerful and it's going to allow people to do things efficiently at lower cost compared to other people and they'll they'll dominate markets and what i'm saying is that we need to get on top of this as best as possible that um i don't know if there's a quick solution there probably isn't but you know to to be to kind of let it to let it run unawares and um to let uh, kind of knowledge and expertise and power be concentrated even more than it is and so much more quickly is is really frightening so let's but david how is that different from people who had cars and who don't, didn't have cars I'm talking about at the beginning of when the when the technology was introduced, not now. Even though there's a major, uh, uh, we have major problems with lack of transportation, but people who were able to afford cars, who got cars, who had cars, when only and it, only a small percentage of the people had access to a technology that gave them an outstanding advantage telephone i remember when uh we got our telephone uh and every, and and we weren't the first and we had a uh what do you call it a party line uh, but what about the people who got part phones that didn't have party lines and who could conduct their business uh, computers? Uh, when I was in law school, uh, I saw the impact computers were going to have, and I <laughs> I spent my money being I was single parent working poor in law school, and I bought a. Uh, transportable do you remember what those are they yep. big old sewing big, machine yes. kind of i bought one of those and i used to lug it to school every single day to take my notes on because i saw the advantage that it could give me and it upset people in fact i i got permission to take my law school exams on it and a petition started that it was an un fair advantage to allow me to take I, my exam, that it was a uh, advantage of the privilege. And I was like, yeah, well, you know yeah, what? Right. A I spend my little woman. money yeah, right. on, a, on a, a, a poor. I spend my little money on a, a laptop. You spend your money on a beer. Hey, if you want a laptop, you certainly got the money to go out and spend it. But the point is, it was a privilege. It was a privilege. But I had enough money to be able to make that choice. And, and I went to school with people. I had, when I was teaching, um, I, had, uh, I had students who could not have afforded a laptop. Hell, they couldn't afford meals. They were going hungry just to stay in law school. And I used to put students up in my house because otherwise they were going to be homeless. This okay. society has always given privilege to people who can afford things and disadvantaged people who cannot. Always and wrong. I know that AI, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree with you because I, I hate writing and I've written a lot. And so I have been going on AI, and I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I would use it in a hot beat if I was still a professor. I would generate text, edit it, and slap some footnotes like nobody business. But it would be a privilege. I understand that. So uh, I and I understand the problem. And I apologize for interrupting, and David and Professor, but we only got three minutes left, and I want to put the hard I want to put the hard question out there, and that is, how do we move the needle from that AI weapon to AI resource for the people who most deserve to make it an equitably available resource, like cars, like 
phones, like computers, have become? How do we make it affordable and user-friendly enough to be an equitable resource for those who most need and deserve it, the underserved, instead of those who will use it as a weapon against those very vulnerable people? How do we do that? Chuck, I would just put, insert the word more equitable, because there are tons of people who can't afford any of the things right. that I, we just listed. Okay. And so there's there's inequity still. Absolutely. So, so, so one of my points is I agree with everything that Professor Randall says, that there's been a there's been cycles that, that have repeated themselves as new developments have come. And my point is that we are now starting a new cycle, something like the okay. Industrial Revolution. And we have an opportunity and maybe it can't be done. But what I'm saying is that it's another new cycle starting. So maybe to the degree we've failed to get on top of these previous cycles to prevent the inequities, maybe we can do something now. Maybe we can make sure that um, the chat GPT skills are being taught in the schools, make it part of the curriculum, make sure that these resources are available in public libraries. Maybe we can be more proactive of making sure that a wider population has exposure to these things other than through the private marketplace and just having to, to buy the best to make sure that it's available for for people at, at no cost that otherwise might not be able to afford it. And I think maybe the school system is one way to do that. So that is exactly the point in the question. That's a fantastic example. How do we make AI move in the direction of being a resource for more equitable access to the key life resources, education, housing, health care, environment? Make it a public good that capitalism can't infect. Wow. If 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 it needs to make it something that is highly regulated and a public good and and that can't be based on for profit model. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna open up the St. Louis swimming pools, right? <laughs> you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Thank well, you, Mr. McGee. This, the this sum is of us. I this is one question. reason why the, the, why the CEO of, of OpenIA was, was fired, if you recall that happened recently, um, because there's a tension. Their mission is to make AI available and, and make the world better. And also their mission is to make money. And that, that tension is right there. And that's what Professor Randall is pointing to. You know, So on one hand, you want to make it more accessible. On the other hand, you want to make sure that the people who are writing the programming that are behind the technology are a diverse population so that you get different viewpoints into the coding and into the platforms. So it's access to finished product and and make sure there's access to the construction of the product. And, we know and it's not that. that you're saying that people can't make a living off of it and right. a decent living off of it. What you're saying is excess capital won't go to shareholders. Right. 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 It'll it will be go, it, it will go to making uh, whatever, the system more equitable, more available, whatever. But it won't go, yeah. Or it will go to the zero sum 1% the way it always has and still does. That's yeah. the question. Will it become the zero sum 1% weapon against the people they have taken from and oppressed for so long? Or will it become a resource to build greater equity for those who most deserve and need it. Good point. On that note, we are out of time. Professor Randall, Professor Larson, we had no idea at the beginning of this that we were going to go. This really is, as we like to call them, a difficult conversation to make good trouble. Thank you so much, Professor Randall. Thank you for inviting me. Professor Larson. Incredible nice insights, incredible perspectives, and incredibly hard questions about exactly what lies ahead for us and we need to stand up and fight for. Thank you. Aloha, be well, be safe, happy holidays all. And think of Think Tech, support us because we are here to make these conversations and these thoughts 
and these stand-up actions happen. Take care. Thank you.